Hey, thank you for dropping by for my daily devotions, 22nd of December, 2023. Man, Christmas is coming right up on us. Um, yesterday we read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Today we're going to read 2 Corinthians 6, Luke 23, Proverbs 21, and Numbers 22. But part of what was read yesterday is... Uh, a passage where he talks about shedding our earthly dwelling and moving on to our heavenly dwelling. The fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, starting at verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. See, this body we live in now, it's going to be destroyed. It falls apart and gets gets all mine. Seven next next week will be seventy five years old. It's going to fall apart someday. It's going to die. The body will. And what happens then? It's the it's the tent that I live in now, and it gets destroyed. And I move out, and I go to be with the Lord. That's how it works. That's how life works. I was thinking about a story that I'll tell you real quick. Back in nineteen eighty one. Um, our son was probably three and a half and um, uh, his great grandpa passed away in, over in Phoenix. And so we went to the funeral, we dressed him up in a little suit and he was real cute and everything. We explained to him, great grandpa went to heaven. You have nothing to be fear, fearful about. We're going to go to his funeral. And while we were leaving, in those days, you'd walk by the open casket when you left, you know, and we did that. And we explained to, explained to him before, great grandpa's in heaven. You don't have to worry about him. So we get outside after walking by the casket, and our, our son saw his great grandpa in the casket. Get outside, tugs on my sleeve. He said, Dad, what, Jeremy? He says, you said great grandpa went to heaven. He, I just saw him in there in that box, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I had to explain to him, he moved out. You know, he just moved out of his body and went to heaven. We had that big discussion so he'd understand. And uh, that's how it works, folks. And we, that's, there's nothing to fear about that when you belong to Christ. Death's good news. The tent's over and you move out to your heavenly dwelling to be with the Lord. Rejoice in that. Hope you hang on to that. Let's pray and we'll jump into the scripture for today. Father, speak to us today. Thank you for your word, which is so true, and for the change that it makes in our life. Speak to us and make us new because we heard from you today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. Genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying yet yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a, as a fair exchange, I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols. For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. You're God's temple, Christian. You're the temple of God. He lives in you. You don't go into the sanctuary to worship. You are the sanctuary. You go into an auditorium to worship or your bedroom or wherever you are, you worship, okay? As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, 
Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And then Luke chapter 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he heard that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him from what he had heard about him. He hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called, called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he has sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to, to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found, no in, him, I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But when the the loud shouts were insistently demanded that, but with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who had mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if Men do these things when the tree is green. What will happen when it's dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. They, they came to the place called the Skull. There they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for what we are, for, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. And he said, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and the dark and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. 
The centurion, seeing that what had happened, pray, had what had happened, praised God and said, "Surely, this was a righteous man." When all the people who were had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man uh, named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and righteous man, upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. And they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. And then Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs 21. Wisdom from Proverbs. We need wisdom, don't we? That's why we read the book of Proverbs. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. That's where we need to put our heart, in the hand of the Lord, so he can direct it. Our hearts, our inner life, our thoughts and feelings. Put it all in the hands of Jesus. All a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked, are sin. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. A fortune made by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor in a deadly snare. The violence of the wicked will drag them away, for they refuse to do what is right. The way of the guilty is devious, but the conduct of the innocent is upright. Better to live in a corner of a roof than, to, than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. The wicked man craves evil. His neighbor gets no mercy from him. When a mocker is punished, the simple gain wisdom. When a wise man is instructed, he gets knowledge. The righteous one takes note of the house of the wicked and brings the wicked to ruin. A man shuts his ears to the cry of the poor. He too will cry out and not be answered. A gift given in secret soothes anger, and a bribe concealed in the cloak pacifies great wrath. When justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. A man who strays from the path of understanding comes to rest in the company of the dead. He who loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and oil will never be rich. The wicked become a ransom for the righteous and the unfaithful for the upright. Better to live in a desert than, than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. In the house of the wise are stones of choice food and oil, stores of cho choice food and oil. But a foolish man devours all he has, just uses it all up. He who pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. A wise man attacks the city of the mighty and pulls down the stronghold in which they trust. He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. A proud and arrogant man mockers his name. He behaves with overweening pride. The sluggard craving uh, the sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work all day long he craves for more but the righteous give without sparing the sacrifice of the wicked is detestable how much more so when when brought with evil intent a false witness will perish and whoever listens to him will be destroyed forever a wicked man puts up a bold front but an upright man gives thought to his ways there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Hang on to that one. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. Numbers chapter 22. Numbers. Chapter 22. Okay. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. 
Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all the Israel, saw all that Israel Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the river in his native land. Balak said, A people has come out of Egypt. They, they cover the face of the land have, and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the country. For I know that those who bless, who you bless are blessed and those who you curse are cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, making, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite princes stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of our land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to, drive, to uh, fight them and drive them away. God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they're blessed. The next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's princes, go back to your own country for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite princes returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other princes more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and they said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you ask. Come and put a curse on these people. But Balaam, Balaam answered them, Even if Balak gave me this palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go uh, beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now stay here tonight as others did, and I will find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them and do only what I tell you. So Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, he turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat him, beat her, to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it, so he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. And the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made, made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. And the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with the sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, Why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me three times. If he had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have but I would have spared her, the donkey. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I've sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the Moabite town on the Arnon border at the edge of his territory. Balak said to Balaam, 
did I not send you an urgent summons? Why didn't you come to me? And I'm, uh, am I really not able to reward you? Well, I've come to you now being rewarded, but can I say, but I, but can I say just anything? I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. Then Balak went with Balak to Kiriath Husoth. Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep and gave some to Balaam and the princes who were with him. The next morning, Balak took Balaam up to Bamoth Baal, and from there he saw part of the people. The Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Father, thanks for addressing our lives today. Thanks for speaking to us. Impact your word on our hearts. Write it there and change us because we heard from you. That's our prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. Hope you have a great day.